Hello everyone. Uh, today's lecture uh, for critical thinking summer 2019 is part two of our treatment of chapter five and kind of gearing up here for the first exam. Because uh, after we get through with this uh, chapter five material, we're going to be um, through all the material that is uh, relevant for exam one. Um, my lecture on Thursday is probably going to be plowing ahead with more material, getting into uh, the chapter six stuff, um, which is going to be for the second exam. So everything is kind of abbreviated during summer quarter, of we've said so many times before. Um, so we have to keep plowing ahead. But um, <clears throat> this is going to be the, the sort of final treatment of everything getting up to exam one. Um, I also wanted to, uh, as a business thing here before we get started, um, I want to again advertise those discussion board uh, threads that I have set up on the Canvas website where you're able to make requests about and ask questions about the homework um, for uh, chapter three and for chapter five here now. Um, and I'm going to be trying to record more videos like I did for the chapter two stuff that um, I'll, I'll, I, you've, you've seen I post responses on the discussion boards, but if you want to make requests for me to go over, hmm, pardon me, got the hiccups. If you want to make requests for certain uh, exercise problems for me to review in greater detail and explain the answers beyond just what you get in the uh, answers that I send out for these assignments, um, please post there uh, before the deadlines that I stated in my last weekend update email. Because once that deadline is over, then I want to record the video the next day and have it posted for people. So uh, there's a little bit of a schedule constraint on that. Um, but always, uh, of course, contact me. Um, I'm still, I'm so, I got some students who would like call me up and ask questions and stuff like that. But it's still a pretty small percentage of the overall class. So for all of those of you, I think if you've talked with me, uh, it's pretty clear how interested I am in talking to you and. Um, we hopefully have some rapport at this point, but for any of you who haven't tested that those waters yet, who haven't haven't had the haven't called me up or had any kind of interaction space with me, I really encourage you to give it a shot and um, let me be more uh, another resource of support for you in setting up for success in this class because I really I really want to be used as a resource. I'm I'm not trying to discourage that in the slightest. So especially gearing up to this first exam, please do that. I also want to underline kind of explicitly in the lecture here uh, just a reminder about how the class is set up that after this first exam, well, after I get them all graded, after the window closes down and everything, um, I will be making a makeup exam opportunity available. So that is a component to this class. So if something does uh, go really wrong with the first exam, you're going to have a chance to kind of basically redo it with different problems, of course. but. Uh, not just redoing the same questions you got on the original exam, but the same type of questions. And you'll be able to kind of replace your scores on the original exam with these sections and your scores on the makeup exam. And I mention that just because I think it helps with um, two things. One, maybe taking away a little the edge of fear that can come with exams um, and maybe free you up to just give it your best shot and not um, be having that fear over hanging over you like the sort of Damocles is shadow kind of thing um, but also because I think it exemplifies it's a way I've structured the class to try to reflect the principles on how I've been encouraging you to participate as a student that this is a process of trial and error it's a process of taking a stab at something even if you're not totally confident about it but giving it a shot seeing how it goes, critically evaluating that attempt, and then seeing what you can learn from it, recalibrating, and going after it again. It's kind of like uh, a lot of stuff that happens in sports. Um, I'm wearing my Cubs hat today. Um, you know, if you're an athlete and you're trying to improve, you still have to play the games, right? You're tested and you're, uh, in your abilities, and your abilities affect whether your team wins or loses. Um, but you still need to... Uh, not just like live with that result like well I gave it a shot and now I know but you're always looking to like critique your own performance and figure out where you can improve on it and and maybe reorient or tweak things to um, to be able to increase your abilities and mastery of that skill um, and you've got coaches and you know you've got this teacher here who can help give you advice about that as well 
Uh, so uh, please use me as a resource. Okay, I think that's all the kind of preliminary things I wanted to make sure to mention here. Um, kind of uh, picking back up from where we left off with the last uh, lecture from Thursday, you did get to see the broad strokes of my uh, proposal about how to attack this whole putting arguments into standard form and diagramming them sort of thing. You got the backwards method in its broad strokes. And just as a kind of reminder of this, I, I still, I, I saved the little, um, where is it here? I saved the, let's get, make sure, there I am. The little whiteboard thing I was working on. If you remember from the last video, I was using the Equal Exchange Coffee essay from the Chapter 3-4 homework as a toy example here of like, here's a passage of argumentative prose that we would want to analyze. Not just for annotations, that was the Chapter 3 material, but also to take the arguments that are present in this passage and put them into the standard form diagram to paint the portrait of the actual argument. Um, argumentative reconstruction, as I like to call it. And we, we started on it a little bit here. Uh, that's what this little whiteboard stuff was about. Um, and we did the really preliminary stuff. Um, the, the, main, you, the way that the backwards method works in the broad strokes is the first thing you do is figure out what is the conclusion of the whole passage. There probably are a lot of arguments in the passage. Because there can you can be making arguments that have this kind of sub-argument structure to them, but what's the bottom line point? What's the speaker trying to ultimately convince you of? What where does the buck stop at the end of the day? Um, what's their bottom line? And in the Equal Exchange Coffee essay, we uh, or I, in talking through it, decided that the ultimate conclusion here is that you should buy Equal Exchange Coffee. That this is a true statement. You, it's true that you should buy Equal Exchange Coffee. And um, the next step after you got that conclusion pinned down, um, which means that you define the claim in standard form and then assign it a number. It's just kind of like a label. And then to start building out the diagram um, that's going to show explicitly all the inferential connections of the arguments, which claims are supporting which other claims. So if this is the ultimate conclusion, then all the support will eventually point to it. Um, and the next step after you've got the conclusion figured out is to, again, look over the passage holistically, not line by line, like left, right, top to bottom, but looking at the whole picture. Uh, you have to do that to figure out what the conclusion is. But then you're looking at it to figure out what are the kinds of appeals, the broad strokes appeals that the speaker or the passage is making to try to defend the truth of that conclusion. How, how do they try to defend it? How do they try to justify it? What kind of reasons do they appeal to? And I was encouraging in the last video I, I, in, in this method um, that you just get a broad gist of it first in your own head. You don't write anything down here yet maybe um, but you just sort of get an idea of it. So in the Equal Exchange Coffee essay, we were like, well, it's something about the taste. You know, taste is, tastes good kind of thing. Something about what's happening with small farmers. Something what's happening with large corporations. And I'm putting that like something in there because you don't want to, you don't necessarily need to like pin it down and uh, right away. Maybe the argument is simple enough that it permits for this. But with more complicated arguments, uh, where there are more complex ideas going on. Um, because we're trying to capture those ideas accurately and clearly with all their subtlety and complexity in there, um, I think it's helpful to just kind of get a lay of the land first before you start really pinning it down. And then once you got the idea of the broad strokes of these things, then you focus on them one at a time. Focus your attention on one argument. Don't confuse it with the other lines of appeal. Focus on them one at a time and start pinning down the claims that make that argument tick. So here we had a really simple argument that we already talked through. We're like, okay, they're appealing to the flavor of it, right? In the passage it says, um, uh, of course, your decision to buy equal exchange need not be completely altruistic. 
for we take as much pride in refining the taste of our gourmet coffees as we do in helping the farmers who produce them. And I like this example because in the in the essay itself, it never says equal exchange coffee tastes good, so buy it. It doesn't give that argument in a straightforward way. But you can look at that and you're like, okay, I got the idea of this. They're saying it tastes good and that's a reason to buy it. Okay. That All the rhetoric around gourmet and it doesn't have to be altruistic, it's kind of a fancy way of saying it tastes good, so you should buy it. And that's what we put into our standard form diagram. Claim two, equal exchange coffee tastes good. This being true gives you a reason to think it's true that you should buy equal exchange coffee. There we go. And this is another good demonstration of how you have a lot of artistic license in putting together the argument in standard form and diagram. You don't have to use the language that the passage uses. And in many cases, you shouldn't. In some cases, the language is so, like the argument is so straightforward and how it's expressed in the essay that a kind of copy paste strategy is fine. It's okay. But in like a case like this one, where it's not as direct as it could be, we want this picture of standard form and diagram to give like the most accessible, you know, pinned down picture of what the argument actually is, what the rational force of the passage uh, is. We want to make that as clear as possible. So sometimes simplifying the language doesn't mean that you're glossing over the ideas. And like, I don't think there's any loss of meaning here when we reduce the passage's way of depicting this argument to just equal exchange coffee tastes good, therefore you should buy equal exchange coffee. I think it captures everything that we need to have cap captured there. Sometimes there's other elements in the passage that are presenting some kind of linguistic meaning but it's not really contributing anything argumentatively, which is another reminder of what we talked about in the last lecture, that your job in standard form and diagram is to capture the ideas of the arguments and not just analyzing the essay. This isn't an English paper kind of exercise. This isn't about language uh, per se. That's not our focus here. We just want to capture the arguments that are in that linguistic passage, right? That's it. So simplifying it, rewording things, these are all tools in your toolkit. We're gonna talk a lot more today about all those different tools that you have and how to exercise them. Um, when is it right to use that tool, when not, you know, things like that. But just like a painter has a lot of different brushes and paints and maybe multimedia stuff to work with, in painting their picture, you've got a lot of tools in your tool belt here, here to work with, and part of doing this project well is knowing what those tools are good for and how to use them. But this isn't going to be super clear-cut. It's not going to be um, always really black and white. And you are going to be, this is, it's a creative activity. It's imaginative. Um, there's, a, there's such a thing as intellectual imagination and intellectual creativity. And this exercise, this kind of analysis, will uh, test your abilities there too, and not just your raw logical or linguistic abilities. So be prepared for that. I always think, um, you know, going into something with the proper expectations sets you up for success with it. And here, be prepared that, and like for on the exam, that you will have to, in certain cases, exert that artistic license, that you're not going to be able to do this in a super mechanical kind of way. But even if it's not mechanical processes all the way down, there are a lot of uh, tips and uh, pieces of advice and models um, and procedures that we can talk about to help. And the backwards method is an attempt to do that in a, in a way that's um, as helpful to you as is possible. Like I said, I think my backwards method is better than the picture you sort of get from the textbook. So again, going back to the, that procedure, first thing, figure out the, the main conclusion of the whole passage. Second thing, get the broad strokes handling on uh, what are just the types of appeals that the speaker is making overall in the entire passage to as direct arguments to support the conclusion. Then start focusing on them one by one and pinning down explicitly what are the claims that make that argument work. Once you've got that, for and I would do this one, and then maybe this one, and then this one, then you can start going through and asking um, 
the claims that make up these arguments, the premises of these arguments for a conclusion, do those premises ever get defended themselves? Does the speaker somewhere in the passage offer some other claim that's going to be in support of that what was a premise of this argument is now a conclusion of another argument? And this is what the book is talking about as a sub argument. And you're, you can keep going with this. So I, I'm just arbitrarily here being like, maybe they back up too. Why should you think equal exchange coffee takes, tastes good? Um, actually, we can do this a little bit. Let me clean this up. Let's not make it six because that's confusing. Um, let's make it three. That would make sense, right? I think there is a claim in the passage that backs up and defends why we should think equal exchange coffee tastes good. Let's go back to that passage. So when it's talking about this, it's saying uh, we take pride in refining the taste of our gourmet coffees, as much pride as we do in helping the small farmers, which again, we already identified that's going to be another argument here that's going to show up. Um, but they're saying um, that they, they take pride in refining the taste. Now again, can we take this idea and maybe boil it down to make it more direct and accessible to understand what the logic is here? I think so. I'm, I'm willing to exert some artistic license here, so how might I put this? Maybe something like, um, the reason you should think that, so here's equal exchange coffee tastes good. Why? Because of something like... Um, Making the coffee taste good is a priority of the Equal Exchange Coffee Company. So that's a claim that they're making <clears throat> that would offer like some kind of evidence or reason for why you should believe that the coffee tastes good. Now, is it definitive? No. Is this a valid argument? No. But that's fine. It's still a reason. Like we, we alluded to before, not all arguments have good support relations on the standard of validity. There still is this idea of inductive strength. Um, so this, and, and again, diagramming the arguments in the essay or the passage that you're asked to analyze doesn't mean you have to twist them into something that actually is a good argument. Sometimes people make bad arguments. And part of what's going to be helpful about putting things into standard form and diagram is it's easier to see what is being claimed or what is being argued for the purposes of being able to evaluate it. And you might already be anticipating that, but we want to hold our horses, right? We want to be able to listen first and understand what someone is saying before we can criticize it or evaluate it for better or for worse. So this whole standard form diagram is not about evaluating arguments. It's still just about listening um, for understanding. So while I've been talking here, you notice I put a line in there and now I'm drawing the little therefore symbol next to number two. And the reason is that number two is a conclusion of an argument. It's a premise of this argument. It's providing support to justify one, but it's also receiving support from three. So we're going to depict these support relations in two ways. One in the diagram with the arrows, which is the most direct and explicit way of doing that but also in standard form. Whenever there's a conclusion or an inference that's being made, a, a leap here in the reasoning, <clears throat> we want to draw a line and put the therefore symbol. So it's kind of like the, what the line in the therefore symbol is depicting is given everything above here, we're in a position to draw the conclusion that equal exchange coffee tastes good. Okay. And once we have that on the table, now we're in a position to draw another inference that you should buy equal exchange coffee. Okay, so that's what's going on here. I really wish there were people here and I could say, is this making sense? But no one is here today, I think. No one has shown up. Yes, no one has shown up yet. Um, so I, I hope that's making sense. Definitely ask me questions um, about what's happening here if, if uh, my lecture is not clearing it up perfectly. Okay, now after... Oh, there's my text message. Is that from a student? Uh, one second. No, it wasn't a student trying to contact us. Uh, it was uh, my family. <laughs> okay, sorry about that interruption. 
So once you've got um, these sub arguments going on, you can even go deeper. I mean, maybe there is an argument offered to support claim three. I mean, it's possible. It's definitely possible. Th these lines of of sub argumentation can go back forever. I mean, it just depends on what arguments are in the passage. So I would follow up on this if I'm using this backwards method of continuing to trace the lines of support backwards. Um, does the essay offer anything in defense or evidence or reason for thinking that making the coffee taste good is a priority of the Equal Exchange Coffee Company? And I'm looking at it and I'm like, nope, I don't see anything like that happening. So I will be, I'll go back to my little efforts here and I'll be like, nope, that's not happening. So we're done. That's where the thread ends. That's as deep into the argument that the passage has gone and so I'm not going to make up other things that you know they haven't said. Which actually alludes to one of our main topics we're going to talk about in the lecture today. Um, we are going to be reading into what people say. Implication, conversational implication, we know is a way in which we communicate with each other and we do it when we argue too. Um, but we want to be very careful about this. Um, we want to capture what the person is really thinking, like what they're really reasoning with. What is the argument? And that argument may have components that were not explicitly said, but were implied. But we need to be very careful when we're doing that interpretation to make sure that we're um, not putting words into people's mouths that they aren't saying. All, I've had many, many clever students, sometimes my best students, that are falling into the trap of basically making arguments for people. Of being like, they didn't make this argument, but they should have. So I'm going to make the argument instead for them. Well, that's not something that you're being asked to do. You're just being asked to diagram what is there. So there's a kind of balancing act we're going to get into here, where on the one hand, if you take everything literally, and don't, you're not sensitive to conversational implication whatsoever, there's a lot of the logic of what people are doing when they're arguing that you're going to miss. In fact, I really love uh, this paper that was written by a very famous contemporary philosopher. He's dead now, but he's, you know, he hasn't been dead long. His name is David Lewis. A brilliant, brilliant philosopher. Did groundbreaking work in epistemology and especially the logic of counterfactuals and possible worlds. And he wrote this little article once where he was like, philosophers are being silly. Professional philosophers. When they talk about what ordinary non-philosophy people think, uh, kind of like the philosophy version of muggles or something, um, about like what is common sense or common opinion or what does the person on the street think, we're oftentimes um, casting the other non-philosophers as if they're not as intelligent as they actually are because we're taking what they say literally. They're not as trained in theoretical articulation as professional philosophers are. So sometimes people aren't able to express their ideas or beliefs or perspectives in a way that seems taken literally as theoretically legitimate. But David Lewis was kind of reminding all of us as philosophers, look, there's a lot more going on there than just what a person is capable of articulating. As a little side note on this, um, I, uh, one of my areas of specialization is cognitive science. And especially uh, in cognitive science, we think a lot about developmental psychology. And I, and I have a almost three-year-old at home, too. And one thing that we've been learning in the last few decades is that the cognitive lives of very young children, including infants, are way more robust than what we previously thought. So where we estimated, you know, where certain cognitive developments end up happening is be getting pushed earlier and earlier rather than later. Um, we've got some better research for indicating this, but one of the reasons why we misestimated it is that the abilities of a child to articulate or express the thinking that they're doing is another skill independently of that thinking. So they develop the thinking first, and then they develop the way to communicate it or to express it in their choices or behavior. And if we're only looking at the behavior and the articulation as the evidence, we basically think kids are dumber than they actually are. One of my favorite books on this subject is The Scientist in the Crib. Um, I think uh, Gopnik was the one who wrote that. And she's arguing that um, 
scientific reasoning is actually present in infants. And she's got, you know, arguments for this, not just theoretical, but also empirical. Um, pretty cool stuff. So similarly here, if we're only looking at what people are literally saying, like being a lawyer about it or something, um, then we're not going to capture all the logic of what's actually happening. We're going to basically straw man the, th the argument we're analyzing. Um, and that's inappropriate. So we've got to read into things a little bit. We've got to be doing some interpretation, some sensitivity to implication. But we also can't just fall off the other end of the boat where we speculate however we want to with no accountability for it and end up projecting meaning that isn't there. Where it's really us making the argument instead of analyzing the argument that's present in the, the thing, the object of evaluation and analysis. Um, hopefully that's making sense, but uh, you're going to see this demonstrated a lot of like the balancing act here. And actually that's a good transition into the next kind of thing I wanted to talk about. Um, I might go back to this and, and kind of cash out more of the complicated arguments here in a second, just for more demonstration purposes, but we've got a lot of theoretical ground to cover here first, so I might do that first. Something else I've alluded to um, for where this lecture is going to go is, uh, well, two things actually. Here, I'm going to pull up my lecture notes. Um, these lecture notes here, what I have is lecture three, um, is really just a summary of what goes on in chapter five. Uh, I've really tried to just like, I, I've got some commentary here and there. There's certain things I'm going to skip in this lecture that are not essential uh, for preparing for the exam, for instance. I actually recommend that you read my entire lecture notes because there's going to be some cool content in here that I won't be able to get to for the sake of time for these lectures, uh, the video lectures, but still worth reading about and thinking about, even though you won't. Anything that's happening in the in the exam will show up in these video lectures, so you can trust to that. Uh, but there's other cool stuff in the curriculum and the material here that is not directly required for the exam, but is still good to know about. Um, so that's why I recommend taking a look at it. But uh, this lecture is basically a straight summary of the book. And as I alluded to last time, my backwards method doesn't proceed in this kind of linear fashion that the book kind of makes it seem. Like this step by step, first do this, then do this, then do this. In my method, you're going to be taking all of those tools and kind of swapping them out and doing them all at the same time, so to speak. It's more like a juggling act than it is a sequential step-by-step -step process. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is that I've been promising in this lecture, I'm going to connect the dots from the Chapter 3 material. So how does what we are annotating for in the annotation project help to inform our judgment calls when we're doing this extended reconstruction, the putting argument into standard form and diagramming it. And let's start with the first one. <clears throat> so in the book's method, it says, do a close analysis of the passage containing the argument first. And this is where I do agree with the linear framework. What a close analysis is, is basically the annotation project. And yes, you should do this first so that you've got some landmarks, some touchstones to inform the rest of your reconstructive efforts. So I do think that is the first thing to do. But then it says, list all explicit premises and the conclusion in standard form. And this is definitely not something you're going to do exhaustively and then move on to the next step in the way that I'm teaching you about how to attack doing this uh, analysis. But it also gets us into argument markers. Okay, so we have to identify argument markers. If you remember from the lecture on this, arguments, uh, we make arguments in language, sometimes explicitly, through saying words like therefore and because. And if you see those things when you're annotating the passage, then you know there's an arrow, right, going back to <clears throat> this diagram you know there's going to be an arrow, and if you can figure out whether it's a reason marker or a conclusion marker, you'll be able to tell what explicit claims are going to be the claims giving the support and which ones are receiving that support. So you're able to know what's going to show up on either end of that arrow. The thing that's ambiguous, though, well, there's a couple things that are ambiguous. One, 
you might not know where that particular argument fits into the whole structure. If you're using my backwards method, this will organically and naturally unfold, like I was saying, like a flower kind of unfolding its petals in front of you. You don't have to work at it. You don't have to force it, like with the metaphor I gave last time of dumping out all the claims as like a bunch of Lego blocks and then trying them out one by one or something to see how they might fit together. That's going to be a really terrible way to approach this. So in some ways, that's some of these ambiguities you're going to be able to to deal with using the backwards method. Um, but it is still, it's a really helpful touchstone to know, hey, there's an argument going on here. So like, for example, when it says, um, uh, oh man, there aren't so many argument markers in this passage. Uh, let's see. Ba -ba 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 -ba. <laughs> So, here we go. There's an explicit argument marker. So, have a couple of equal exchange coffee and make a small farmer happy. So is a conclusion marker. And it's an explicit one. So I know automatically there's an argument there and I, at the end of the day, I better have that showing up somewhere in standard form and diagram. So that's useful. It's a great way to double check your answers too. If you see argument markers, you know there's an argument and it better be showing up in your picture. Um, another thing that I can uh, alert you to about this is that if you're seeing argument markers showing up in your claims, like if three had an argument marker in it, then you know something's gone wrong. There's been a screw up here because a, an argument has at minimum two claims, not just one. So we shouldn't be seeing arguments inside one of these numbered things in standard form. We want to separate out all the claims into individual entries here so we can see how they relate to each other in arguments. We don't want to obscure that structure. We want to reveal it. So you'll always know if you're double checking your answers here. If you see an argument marker in one of what you're calling a premise or a conclusion, you know that this needs to be broken down a little bit more that there's a problem there. Okay, the other big, big thing about argument markers that's important to remember here that creates ambiguity is that it's not as though if you capture everything that has an argument marker, you've captured the whole argument. Because we also argue without using argument markers. And this is getting into where you're like thinking about implication. As I was going through this uh, Equal Exchange Coffee essay a second ago, I was like, oh, no, 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 where are the argument markers? There aren't a lot, but there is a lot of arguing. There is an argument here about how uh, if you buy coffee from large corporations, you're inadvertently maintaining a system which keeps small farmers poor while lining the pockets of rich corporations. There's actually two arguments going on there. It's saying don't buy coffee from large corporations. Why? Because by doing that, you support an unjust system, or at least a harmful system. And two, uh, the whole rhetorical phrase of lining the pockets of rich corporations implies, through metaphor, Gricean maxim violation of quality there, it, there's an implied meaning that the rich corporations don't really need your money. Small farmers do, rich corporations don't. That's a reason not to buy coffee from large corporations. Um, that's an argument that's being offered there. No argument markers. There are no argument markers in that passage. None. The if here, not an argument marker. That's just talking about a conditional. If this, then this. That's one claim, not an argument. But you can kind of hear your intuitive voice like picks up on this stuff. You can tell there's an appeal that's being made. There's a reason being offered to justify a certain conclusion. Um, if someone is encouraging uh, a belief or a perspective on the basis of something else. There's support that's being given to justify that. You can pick up on that. And that also is going to have to get reflected into your standard form and diagram. Okay? So, this is already a very early lesson in how approaching these assignments like mechanically, literally, like a rules lawyer kind of thing, a grammar lawyer, uh, is not going to get us everything that we need. So it is good to be tracking where the arguments are. That's part of the method that I was encouraging, right, on the backwards method. Kind of like try to 
scope out where the argument of appeals are sort of happening and then start pinning down what are the explicit premises and the explicit conclusion that you see for those arguments. And that you might start by going off of just the language that's there. And again, you might rephrase it, you might revise it to draw out the point uh, more carefully. Uh, in the, the text from the chapter here, from the textbook, this is what the book is talking about as clarifying the premises and the conclusion where necessary, like revising it, uh, reducing ambiguity and vagueness, maybe rewording, maybe providing a definition, um, having consistent language in how you're uh, articulating the claims in standard form is helpful, uh, all those sorts of things. And this is, again, like I talk about in the lecture notes, it's a judgment call. It's sometimes tricky to tell whether you should be doing this or not. Um, but make your best judgment call here. And then, as I already was alluding to, another step here, another thing to be tracking in the juggling act is trying to break up those premises as much as possible. Um, sometimes one sentence has multiple claims in it, like we just saw in the passage I was looking at. Um, it may be a little early in the morning to bring this up. That's irrelevant. There's no argument around that. Whatever. We're going to ignore that. But if you buy coffee from large corporations, you're inadvertently maintaining the system which keeps small farmers poor while lining the pockets of rich corporations. There's two big claims there. By buying coffee from large corporations, if you did that, you would be uh, supporting a system which is harmful. And then it's a sec second claim. It's a totally logically separate point um, to say that the, the rich corporations don't need, the big corporations don't need your money. Right? Lining the pockets suggests uh, useless wealth, wealth that isn't going to be doing anything. Now, you might disagree with this, but again, we're not. this isn't about whether we agree or disagree. It's just about listening to the argument that's offered. And in that one sentence, there are definitely two distinct claims to pull apart. And so we'd want to give them, once we figure out where they're supposed to go in the standard form diagram, we'd want to make them separate numbered entries. Okay. Okay, so you will start with what's explicit. And that is, that's part of what the book, like I mentioned last time, the book isn't wrong. Um, I just think the way in which it presents this as being a more linear process is, is, a, is misleading. Um, but the content of what it's talking about, about what you should be doing to do a good job here with your standard form diagram analysis is, is on the money. And um, one thing that it does in its step-by-step -step procedure is it's doing a lot of talking about what's explicit first and then getting into what is implicit. And this is what it, it talks about as uh, this section on suppressed premises. And also it's a little bit involved here with the clarification step two, where you might revise the meaning, right, to draw out what it maybe is implied here in a more direct literal way. Like when they say we take pride in 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 making our and we take pride in the taste of our gourmet coffees, in refining the taste of our gourmet coffees. I and mean, this sort of implied what's going on there, but they're basically saying it tastes good, right? So you can use uh, conversational implication and interpreting all that as a part of revising and clarifying claims, but the most explicit and extreme example of this will be with suppressed premises. But just like we saw with conversational implication with Paul Grice, you can't start thinking about the implied meaning, uh, you know, if you're giving a, a, an analysis of this, until you've got a handle on what is the literal meaning. Without the linguistic act, you don't get the conversational act. You're not in a position to be able to see what's happening there. Um, so there is a progression here. And in our efforts in reconstruction, it is a good maxim, it's a good rule of thumb here to be following, that first we want to pin down what is explicitly in the passage, and then we want to start thinking about what is implicit, or what are what is completely even unspoken, but which is still a part of the argument, and that's going to be this phenomenon of suppressed premises. Um, so that's where this is all going. Um, but you can kind of see how the way I've been talking about the backwards method is jumping around a little bit in what order you do all these things. Um, step five, arrange the argument, the parts of the argument into a, tr a chain or tree of sub-arguments where this is possible is talking about diagramming. And, uh, and we're not waiting till step five to do this. You know, we're doing, uh, under the backwards method, we're doing this at the same time 
as we're doing the standard form. And I, and I think that's definitely the right way for you to go with this. I think that's going to be a lot more straightforward for you. Okay, um, we've got a number of places I could go next in the lecture. Um, suppress premises we've got to get to sooner or later. But I think before we do that, let's set that up by going over diagrams themselves a little bit more. Because the diagram is a kind of linguistic system. It's got semantic and syntactic conventions to it. And I want to explain the entire vocabulary of what you're working with here with, the, with this symbolic way of representing the argument. Um, so let's talk about that next, and then we'll be in a good spot to talk about suppressed premises. So uh, maybe I'm going to, just for the time being, make a, a new whiteboard here. Can I do that? Maybe I'm going to pause the video for a second. Okay, here we go. Um, so let me show you what are sort of the options of what you can do when you're drawing diagrams. So we already know the basic uh, structure here. We could have a claim supporting another claim. Buy equal exchange coffee. Why? Because it tastes good. That's it. Um, here we go. Hey, I got arrows. There's an arrow. I can just make it a lot easier. <laughs> eh, that looks ugly. Mm. My aesthetic preferences revolt. Okay, let's just do this. All right, so you can have an arrow pointing from one number to another number. Simple as that. Um, and this is representing that two is a reason to think that one is true. But there's a lot of arguments that don't work just this simply. Plenty of arguments work like that. But uh, others are different um, in that they require multiple claims in order to have a reason to do something or to believe something. And let me give you an example. This is one of the most basic arguments that exists, and I'll, I'll make the video bigger here. So, there's a pen cap. I'm holding it in the hand. Okay, I'm going to kind of... Premise one. There's a pen cap in one of my two hands. Premise two. It's not in my right hand. And actually, the mirror is, if you're watching this on YouTube later, remember that uh, the video that you're seeing, well, actually, there's no one in the chat right now. So <laughs> the video is mirrored. You can see the C is backwards on my hat here. This is my right hand. So I tell you, it's not in my right hand. So you're, you're right. Um, therefore, what can you conclude? Again, premise one, pen caps in one of my two hands. Premise two, it's not in my right hand. Therefore, line therefore symbol, what's the conclusion? Pen cap is in my left hand. If those two premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. That's a good argument. That's not just a good argument, that's a valid argument. That's process of elimination. P or Q, not P, therefore Q. It's one of the basic forms of logical reasoning that we've got to work with. Um, it's, it's the, the form, um, well, no, I won't go, okay, that's a tangent. I'm not going to get on that tangent. Um, so that argument is a good argument. And, but notice something about it. Notice how it's not a good argument if you only have one of the premises. So like if I tell you there's a pen cap in one of my two hands, are you like, oh, therefore it's in the left hand. You, you're not entitled to draw that conclusion. If you, all you know is I have a pen cap in one of my two hands, you can't make an assumption about which one is the one with the pen cap. Or what if I told you I don't have a pen cap in my right hand? You just have that premise to go off. Are you going to immediately infer, oh, Tim must have a pen cap in his left hand? No. It's very possible that I, I don't have a pen cap in either hand. Right? Just because it's not in one hand doesn't mean it's not in the other. Or it doesn't mean it is in the other. Okay? So if we we're going to think about this as like, let's put it back into 
uh, our little diagram that we're doing here, um, we say conclusion. There's a pen cap in Tim's left hand. And the reason for thinking this is true is So this is the argument in standard form here. And you're getting some more examples up here of uh, how standard form works. So we got this. This is the argument. How are we going to diagram it? We've got some options. If we do it like this, It's a lot easier to draw on a, on a whiteboard. Whoa. That. If we drew it like this, we are misrepresenting the argument. This is not an accurate picture. Because what this is saying is that 2 all by itself gives you a reason to think 1 is true. And 3 all by itself gives you a reason to think that 1 is true. And that's absurd. Um, to know, like, just imagine covering up one of these things over the other. I could actually do this. Let's do that solid color. Okay. So I'm, like, going to block off part of this here. If we're just considering two, there's not a pen cap in Tim's right hand. Therefore, there's a pen cap in Tim's left hand? No, that makes no sense at all. How about this way? There's a pen cap in either Tim's left hand or his right hand. Therefore, there's a pen cap in Tim's left hand? No, that's absurd. And again, you know, sometimes people make absurd arguments, but if there's an interpretation of what's going on here that makes the speaker not claiming something absurd, we want to go with it. Why? Because of philosophical charity. Um, to do otherwise would be to straw man the argument. Like, this is the worst possible version of how I could depict the logic of this argument. And there's a much better version here that we could do instead. So here's another option. Let's just let's just put this off to the side for a second. Whoa. Didn't want this to happen. I just cut a hole in my whiteboard. There we go. Okay. Uh, all right. We've got another option for what we can do here. We can make this one inference. instead of two arguments. And it'll look like this. Two plus three supports one. So like that. And we put this little line here to show like these are the claims that together give me a reason to think one is true. So once I put two and three together, now I'm like, this is an airtight argument. This is a valid inference to proving the conclusion. As long as these two things are true, this has to be true. There's no other option. So if I'm looking at, I've got you know, this option for how I can uh, put together the diagram of the support relations of the argument, or I've got this option, well, this second one is much preferred because it paints the argument in the strongest possible light. And this one just paints the argument as absurdly terrible. So this is part of, of, of basically how we're going to navigate the judgment calls in making decisions about what someone is implying. Right? Anytime we have to interpret the words that we're being given in the passage we're analyzing, we always want to interpret with charity where possible. Um, and to use charity is not to put words in their mouth that they're not saying, it's to take what they have said and casting it in the strongest possible light. Um, so charity has got to be the principle that governs how we infer meanings. 
And this is also something that we had established from Chapter 2 and Paul Grice's theory of conversational implication. You remember saying how I said how that Paul Grice's theory is operating under the assumption that people are, for the most part, rational and trying to make rational decisions as a part of a, a conversation. Um, all of the ways in which implication is generated under Paul Grice's theory comes from something that appears to be irrational, but if we just change the way we're thinking about that implied meaning, how we change the literal meaning into the implied meaning, maybe we can make sense of how what initially looked wacky and goofy, irrational and absurd actually does make sense. Maybe you watched the video that I recorded uh, about the um, chapter two homework and the does a dog need to go for a W-A-L-K. Now spelling out words seems silly and absurd. Why would anyone ever do that? It take, It's so inefficient. And then you're like, oh wait, wait, whoa, maybe there's something more going on. Maybe there's some extra implied meaning here that allows me to see how this is not inefficient and irrational, but is actually supremely efficient. It is the most efficient option for how to conduct this conversation. That's the same thing we're doing here. When we're trying to interpret what is the argumentative content of what someone is saying, uh, we're going if we have if, if someone is explicitly arguing poorly, like they just said, there's not a pen cap in Tim's right hand, therefore there's a pen cap in Tim's left hand. Well then I mean, everything is explicitly being given there. Um, there's an explicit argument marker. We just have to be like, yep, I guess that's what they're saying. I think that's silly, but that's the argument they offered. But wherever it's unclear, wherever it, it's not explicit what the speaker is doing, when it comes to the domain of the implicit, then we're going to make cho choices. We're going to make judgment calls about what to interpret there based on what seems to make the most sense. What would be the most rational? What would be the strongest possible way of wording what they're saying? Um, and strong in the sense of rationally defensible, okay? So not strong in the sense of like interpreting them as making wild claims that are going to give them a higher burden of proof, right? We're trying to avoid that. Okay, these are the basic me mechanisms of the diagram. There's pretty much nothing else. The only other thing that we might add to this is that, um, let me grab this again. Once you've got an argument, you can have sub-arguments, right? So maybe three is getting some defense here um, in another argument. Like, let's say it's getting some support from four. And what the hell, let's give it a little bit more. Um, I'm feeling a little bit like Bob Ross right now. Let's make another happy little argument right over here and this argument is going to be more complicated let's just to show you the limits of what can happen here let's say it's five plus six plus seven and what the hell let's give it an extra one plus eight yeah there we go sometimes arguments can have a lot of premises to them and they're all individual claims. You wouldn't want to lump them all into one thing in standard form. They're all claims that are true or false independently of each other. They're logically separated. And that's that judgment call about how to carve up different individual claims is very similar to the judgment call about whether to carve up arguments as being different or part of a single argument. Okay, So this kind of stuff can happen. Um, I will say this. Generally, we want to break things up as much as possible. So try out this format first before going with this format and see if there's any distortion. Even if it seems like, oh, the case for one is stronger if you took this argument with this argument, they still might be logically independent. I mean, the, the reason why we would choose in favor of separating them is if the appeal of two supporting one stands or falls independently of what's happening with three supporting one. In other words, if I'm giving two arguments for a conclusion, one of them is good, the other one is bad, uh, you know, the, the bad one doesn't necessarily cast a light on the other one that maybe is still good. That's the point there. So again, some situations are going to look like this, some situations are going to look like this. In the way that I set up these sub-arguments, you know, you've got five, six, seven, and eight that all need to go together to give me a reason to, to think that three is true. 
But completely independently of that, we've also got this argument that 4 all by itself gives me a reason to think 3 is true too. So those are some of the things that can happen. The only other thing I feel I need to talk about here to clarify is that um, you can't have this. Oh, whoa, what happened there? Let me try that again. Eh. Come on. Okay, here we go. And I'm just getting a little OCD on this. There we go. That's nice and clean. So this is a syntax error. This makes no sense. You cannot have a support relation supporting one of these plus signs. Um, every argument has as its conclusion a claim. So every arrow needs to come from some numbers and then it terminates with a single number. Okay, that's always going to happen. So this doesn't make any sense. That would make sense. This would make sense. This would make sense. Okay, those are, those are legitimate uses of the conventions of the diagram. Okay, that's pretty much it. There's nothing more to say. Um, we're going to come back to diagrams, and, and you'll see me do one other thing that there's a little variation on this, but it actually, I'm, I'm just going to be doing that for clarification purposes. It's not a strict rule of what you have to do for constructing diagrams. This is basically it. There, there's nothing more uh, to talk about in terms of other things that can happen with the diagrams. It's a very simple linguistic system because there's only one thing it's trying to represent, support relations. That's it. That's it. That's all we got. Um, okay, I think this is a good place for me to take just a short break. Um, so I'm going to do that, and then when we come back, let's we'll start trying to tackle the, the big elephant in the room, the suppressed premises. So that's going to be nice. See you in a, in a short second. All right, back at it. Um, before I go further into this, all this complexity around suppressed premises, and we throw these other wrinkles into the mix. Let's just do a little taking stock of um, complexity with arguments. I have a few comments about this. And it, it relates back to some things I've said about um, what the exam is going to be like uh, and how it compares against the homework problems and the paper project that you're doing for me right now, too. Um, first thing to say is that when it comes to the, the complexity of arguments, um, some of them are more simple and some of them are more elaborate. And a lot of the homework exercises that you have for Chapter 5 deal in really simple arguments. In fact, there was a little bit of uh, foreshadowing of standard form in the Chapter 3 homework too, but it's like really straightforward arguments. In the Chapter 5 ones, they're throwing a little bit more wrinkles at you, like removing irrelevant claims and that kind of stuff, stuff that doesn't have argumentative content, revising claims slightly, pulling apart claims, slightly more complicated argumentative structure, um, but they're still pretty simple. They're like an, an argumentative passage to analyze is just maybe a couple sentences um, and not something very elaborate. There's a couple little harder problems on the, on the homework, but pretty simple. And on the exam, I'm going to have three sections that involve standard form activities. One of them is going to be really simple arguments, a lot like the homework exercises. They're much more straightforward, and I'm actually going to tell you, don't even worry about suppressed premises with these. Just work with what you're sort of being given straightforwardly. There's still going to be some conversational implication going on, but this, all this stuff about suppressed premises we're going to talk about in a second. I'm telling you, don't even have to worry about that. I've got a second section of, again, pretty simple arguments, but that are... I'm going to tell you explicitly to be worried about suppressed premises. Again, more on that in a second, but still pretty, pretty basic. Not very involved. And then the last section of the exam is the doozy. And this is the one that's going to be a lot closer to, say, like analyzing this Eagle Exchange Coffee essay example, or like um, the paper project, but much more limited, not 500 words, but maybe like a short paragraph. 
And with those ones, you're going to have to do the annotations for it, put it in standard form, and diagram it um, instead of just a simple standard form sort of thing. And, and so those are going to be more demanding, and they're definitely going to be harder than the homework problems. And that's where the paper project is giving you some better experience and practice to prepare you to be able to do that. Um, so that, that's one thing to say right there. Some, some of the things I might be offering in terms of advice or even the backwards method itself with really simple argumentative passages, it's like maybe that's making it more complicated than it has to be. Like this is much more straightforward. There's not as many questions or judgment calls that you have to make, uh, questions to answer or judgment calls you have to make in order to capture those arguments accurately and clearly. And you don't want to overthink it. This is where talking to me and getting feedback and on like say your paper project or on your homework answers is really helpful because some of my students that I've had in the past with this class are not are, are simplifying things too much. They're not as sensitive to some of the details um, or the complexities and that's not showing up in their portrait of the argument. But I also always have students who are falling off the other end of the spectrum that are making things way more complicated than they actually are. We want to capture the argument as it's given, as clearly and as straightforwardly as we can. Um, like when I reduced the equal exchange coffee essay passage to just the coffee tastes good. Right? That captures the full ideas that are relevant for the argument, even if there's some fancy language that's been weeded out and stuff like that. That would be a good case of simplification. Um, and we don't need to just make things more complicated to make them more complicated. The whole goal is that the standard form diagram is easier uh, as a way of grasping the argument than the original passage that's being analyzed. That's part of the point, to make it more explicit what's actually happening, to pave the way for our debate around it, our evaluation of the argument. It'll be easier to see what's going on with it. So keep that in mind while you're working on this. But there are a couple other tips I've got here about ways in which arguments can be complicated that are good to be tracking. One of these is that arguments can be complicated either because the claims that make up the argument are sophisticated. There's a couple pro problems on the homework that I really like for this. Um, I'm not going to show you them right now, but um, imagine here with the diagram and everything Let's say you've got this argument structure right here. There's only three claims in the argument. In terms of the structure, it's really simple. But maybe claim one or claim two or claim three, in terms of the content that's showing up in standard form, they might be pretty elaborate types of claims. Um, if any of you have studied philosophy before, you know that sometimes a philosophical thesis, which is just one claim, can be pretty complicated. It can have a complex idea that is being claimed, or, or anything that's getting like more theoretical, oftentimes uh, takes a lot more words. Like the one claim could be like a lot of words. So sometimes arguments are complicated because their ideas are complicated. Um, the, the, the claim that's being made is more elaborate than really straightforward claims like the coffee tastes good. Um, if we we're going back to the equal exchange coffee essay here, um, Take a look at some of the claims that show up when they're when they're making this argument that's broadly about how buying equal exchange coffee helps small farmers. One way it helps small farmers is with this idea that um, trading directly with small farming cooperatives at mutually agreed upon prices with a fixed minimum rate will allow for there to be a guaranteed fair price for those farmers even if the coffee market declines. Everything I just said there is one claim. It has multiple ideas, but it's just making one claim. Part of what makes that claim elaborate is all the conditions, right? The hypothetical conditions. If you do this, then if this is to happen, this would be the result. But that's still just one claim, okay? So that's one way arguments can be complicated. And uh, wink, wink, in that last section of the exam, where you have to do the, the more full, complicated uh, argumentative reconstruction, annotation, standard form diagram, the whole, the whole bit with like a paragraph. One of those problems, I've, I'm, I'm happy letting the cat out of the bag on this. There's only going to be two ones because they take more work, so I'm, I'm only going to give you two of them for the exam. But one of them 
is going to be more complicated because of this feature, that the claims involved are more elaborate. But the structure might be pretty simple. Another one that I'm going to give you, though, is going to be more complicated in a different way. So sometimes arguments are complicated, not because the individual claims that make them up are fairly elaborate, but because there is a lot of different argumentative appeals that are happening. So you can imagine like, you know, something like this. So, you know, if we're going to look at this argument right here, you know, maybe all those claims, one, two, three, four, five, six, are all pretty straightforward, simple ideas. Um, but there's a lot of argumentation happening. We've got five arguments here. Um, so sometimes the structure of the argument is more elaborate. Not necessarily the content of the claims that make up that argument um, in total, but the number of different arguments that are being made might be more complicated. Wink. There's going to be a problem like that, too, on the exam. Um, so be careful about that. One final tip about complicated arguments that have complicated structures to them, where there's lots of inferences. Something I've just noticed from working with students over the years is that this seems to show up a lot in the, um, the uh, essay project, is students seem to have a tendency for treating an argument like this. take me a little while to draw this here. This will work. Okay. Like this. One is true. Why? Because of two. Why is two true? Because of three. Why is three true? Because of four. Why is four true? Because of five. Why is five true? Because of six. This is the kind of form of reasoning that you see in something like Sherlock Holmes. Whether and, and really this works for whether you're watching the BBC Sherlock or you've seen the Robert Downing Jr. movies or the Basil Rathbone movies from way back or just reading the books. Um, Sherlock Holmes oftentimes argues or reasons in this kind of way, like really deep substructure. But that's weird. Most of us are not Sherlock Holmes. And my guess is your essay that, you're, that you've written for the paper project is not reasoning this way either. Um, I think part of the temptation is that students are just kind of feeling like they don't know what to do with putting things into structure. And so they are doing maybe that left, right, top to bottom, like essay analysis kind of thing. And so they're like, well, this claim came first. And then we talked about this. And then we talked about this. But the arrows are not representing that. The arrows are not re representing the order in which ideas were presented. They're representing support relations. So I always tell students, respect the arrow. When you're drawing this portrait and you put an arrow here, you're saying the person who's arguing whatever passage is being analyzed, whether that's yours or exam problem or whatever, the speaker is saying this is true because of this, or given this, therefore this is true. All right, that's what's going on. And that might not be what's going on in the essay. Way more often, our arguments look like this, that we're giving multiple reasons for thinking the conclusion is true not this really embedded substructure. It can still happen, it's just like it happens with Sherlock Holmes, but it's just kind of rare. That's not the usual way in which things work. Um, so be careful about that. And that also gets me to a strategy tip about how to double check your answers. After you're done putting the argument into standard form and diagram, look at it the way I'm going to look at it when I'm grading you. I'm going to be like, okay, this is the portrait you painted. Uh, you have six supporting one. 
Is that a reasonable construction on what's going on in the passage or not? You might interpret things slightly different than me. You might carve up the argument a little different than the way that I would. Um, but I can, I can look at that and be like, is this a reasonable construction or interpretation of the argument or not? And there, there might be some gray areas in there, which I give a little bit of benefit of the doubt on, but there's some pretty clear, no, that's not what's going on in the passage things as well. Um, so that's how I'm going to be grading it. Um, and so I encourage you to look at it the same way. If you draw an arrow, be like, is that what's really happening? Let me look back at the passage. Are they really doing that in the passage or not? And nine times out of ten, you can detect your own errors. Oftentimes when I'm reviewing exam problems with students after they've taken the exam, I, I all I have to do is just be like, okay, so what you're saying in your answer is that this is true because of these reasons. Is that what's going on? What do you think in the passage? And then they're like, oh, yeah, no, I don't think that's what's going on. So sometimes just a little double checking with yourself of like taking your own picture seriously and being like, I'm by drawing this picture, I've represented the argument in a certain way. Is that what's actually happening in the passage? And you can usually catch when it's not. Okay, so that's um, that's what I wanted to say about that. About ways arguments can be complex. Um, some some phenomenon of how things sometimes work to be tracking and keeping an eye on. Um, but let's go back here to a really simple argument. Here's just one claim supported by one other claim. Actually, I want to make I want to just make this a little bit bigger. Oh no. Undo. And we can just get rid of this for right now. Right. So now we're, we're going to start talking about, well, oh, 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 I, I should double check here before I go further. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go back to some things I've been promising about connecting with the annotations um, before we, we put more stuff on the plate. So I already talked about how argument markers are going to be really helpful to us. Um, explicit argument markers, they don't tell us what all the arguments are, but they definitely tell us where arguments are definitely happening. Um, and that would need to be reflected and respected in your portrait of the argument in standard form and diagram. What about assuring, guarding, and discounting? How do you handle those things? Uh, and how are they relevant here? Assuring and guarding are important, as the book talks about, because sometimes these things can be dropped. Sometimes assuring and guarding terms can be omitted from the explicit argument. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Now, I, I am going to say here by way of prefacing, um, I'm not as concerned with these details for the exam. I'll just be honest about that. Um, there's some, some nitpicking that we can get into here. But uh, I give some advice in the lecture notes here about um, how assuring works. Uh, I say, while this isn't always true, the general rule here is that appeals to authority should be represented. Even if they're incomplete arguments, you at least get some idea of how the person is gesturing at a support for a position, even if you don't get the full-fledged argument. That would be useful for putting into standard form and diagramming when we're thinking about using that as a device for further conversation and debate. It would tag that there's a kind of promised argument that hasn't been given. Like when someone says, studies have shown that this is true. I mean, I don't know a lot about what's going on with that arguer, but I do know that this person thinks there's some studies out there which have provided some empirical evidence that supports the truth of that claim. Um, so they, I get some, some idea of what the basis is. But things like commenting or expressing on the strength of our belief in order to conversationally imply backup reasons, there's nothing much you can do with that in standard form and diagrams. So you can just drop that. And in fact, uh, you know, in terms of the logical or conceptual content of a claim, someone expressing their confidence doesn't really affect the content of the claim that they have confidence in. So that's why you can drop those things. When someone says, like, well, it's just what I think, but blah, blah, blah. That little caveat in there, like, I, I'm just really sure, obviously, this is true. All that stuff, obviously, that can be dropped when you're putting the claims into standard form. Guarding is a little tricky. Um, just really quickly here, I say, uh, the real question you want to ask yourself is whether the guarding move, the sort of words or phrases that put those caveats that weaken the claim, are they 
part of the scope of the claim being considered? Are they a part of the content of it? So like when the we had that problem from the homework about historically public debt leads to inflation. Um, you can't just put public debt leads to inflation. That's a different idea than the claim Histor the historical pattern is that public debt leads to inflation. Um, to, for them to just say public debt leads to inflation is a much stronger claim that's more easily disproven, so you would be representing the argument in a different light than what they actually said, by, and so you have to keep that historically bit in there. But in other cases, it doesn't matter. So like this example I've got, uh, it seems reasonable to think that Meredith is off of work by now so she can give us a ride to the party. Explicit argument marker here, conclusion marker for so. Um, but as I point out here, I say, in this case, it isn't the reasonableness of the belief that would entail that Meredith can give us a ride. It would be the truth of the fact that she is off of work by now that makes it uh, possible for her to give us a ride. Why we should think that that can happen. Um, so, uh, Sometimes here uh, the guarding phrases can be dropped, sometimes not. The rule of thumb or the, the dividing principled line here is whether the guarding terms are affecting the content of the claim that's being asserted. Okay. Um, the other sort of tip here is that usually, I say generally but not always, it's less likely that you should drop guarding terms for conclusions than you should for premises. And part of this is that um, you know, the weaker the conclusion, the the less burden of proof there is, the less strength there has to be in the claims of the premises in order for it to be sufficiently strong to make it a good support relation. Um, if you uh, don't include those guarding terms for the conclusion, you can make what otherwise would be an adequate defense of a claim into what is not an adequate defense of the claim. So that's a concern there. But these are these are more minor points. Um, repeating claims and irrelevant claims, weeding those out are really important to do. Um, what makes a claim irrelevant? Well, any claims that don't have any bearing on the truth of a conclusion or some other claim that's in the passage, those can be dropped. Um, a really uh, tricky case to sort out that you have to make a judgment call about are examples. So when people use examples in their as a part of argumentative prose, uh, or just talking, um, sometimes they those examples do argumentative work. Sometimes examples are being used as a kind of evidence to prove that something is true, or usually more likely, that something is possible. I can prove that something is possible by showing you an instance of it actually happening. You know, if it actually happens, that shows it's possible for it to happen. Um, but other times, examples are not being used as evidence. They're not a reason to think that something is true. They're really just illustrations. They're just helping the audience understand the claim that's being made. So I make a claim and I say, it like this. Like in this example, it would work out like that. That's to provide clarification of the idea, not a reason to think that the idea is true. Okay, And that's a really important distinction. So if an example is being used purely for illustrative purposes, it shouldn't show up in standard form and diagram. It doesn't need to get into your portrait of the argument. It might inform how you articulate that claim when you put it into standard form to make sure that you've got the right idea of what they're saying. Um, it, you know, as an illustration, it can be illustrative, but it's not evidential, and so it wouldn't be like its own standard form premise that you put in the diagram. Okay, repeated claims are also something to keep track of here. Um, English classes have taught us. I still, I mean, it definitely happened for me, and I always talk to students who are like, yep, I've definitely heard that message from my English class, that if you're going to bring up an idea multiple times while you're writing, you should reword it to make it more interesting to the reader. It makes, it's just better rhetoric uh, to, like, re rephrase claims, uh, to use synonyms, you know, use a thesaurus to sort out other ways of saying the same thing. But for logic, it's confusing. You know, if we use different words, we have to sort out like, wait, is that the same claim that they were saying earlier, just reworded? So if you do see repeated claims in a passage, it's a good idea to pick one articulation of that idea and stay consistent about it. For example, um, if you've got a claim in standard form and it's being used for multiple arguments, 
repeat the number. Like the number can show up in multiple places in the diagram. That's okay. I shouldn't have erased what I had before. Um, so I could illustrate that. But that's okay. You know, make sure it's the same claim every time. Um, that'll be clearer. That'll be a clearer picture of what's happening logically and argumentatively. So that's assuring and guarding. Discounting. Let's talk about discounting. Um, and actually, let's, uh, yeah, let me just erase all this. Let's start over here. Fresh. So I got, um, I got, I really like this example of the ring is expensive but beautiful. Okay, so the ring is expensive but beautiful is was a, a paradigmatic case of discounting that we talked about before. I kind of like this passage because the ring is expensive but beautiful it has a lot of implication in it, argumentatively. There's no explicit argument marker, but we can pick up on our little voice, intuitive voice can tell us, yeah, there's an argument happening here. What would be the conclusion? Well, this is actually a case of an implied conclusion. Uh, we haven't talked about suppressed premises yet, but you can have suppressed conclusions. I always have students who work on their paper project, and they're like, Tim, I think I screwed up with my paper because I can't find my conclusion. And sometimes I look at it, and I'm like, no, you've got a conclusion there. You're just leaving it unspoken. You're like, the audience can figure it out. You maybe didn't state it explicitly, but it's there. And that's happening here in the case of the ring is expensive but beautiful. Um, the ring is expensive but beautiful seems to be a consideration for why we should buy the ring. Why? Because the ring is beautiful. Now, okay, so that's straightforward. Uh, we can put this in the standard form and we can make a little diagram about it. Put our little therefore symbol in here. There we go. We've got two supporting one. Okay. The ring is beautiful, therefore we should buy the ring. But in that passage, the ring is expensive but beautiful. What do we do about the expensive part? Right? That seems to be a claim that they're making. They're saying the ring is expensive. But this doesn't make any sense. Oop. If we just put this claim in, the ring is expensive into standard form, where's that supposed to go in the diagram? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, the ring is expensive, therefore we should buy the ring? That's not what they're saying. That's not a part of the idea of the original passage that we're analyzing. It's got this discounting move, right? What is discounting? Anticipating objections and dismissing them. So how do we capture that in standard form? Not this way. This is the way to do it. And there's a kind of rubric here that I'll give you. So the objection that blank fails. And the blank is where you fill in the content of the objection. So the objection that we shouldn't buy the ring because it is expensive fails. That's really the claim here that captures the discounting move. So you can always just think about it like, kind of like Mad Libs, just fill in the blank. The objection that blank fails. If you recognize discounting happening in your annotation, I told you you could double check your answer by being like, what is the objection being discounted? This is where that information would be helpful for going into the stage of standard form and diagram. What's the objection? Well, that it's expensive, so we shouldn't buy it. When they say the ring is expensive, but beautiful, that but move is discounting the objection. And think about it in terms of the diagram here. Claim three, if it's true, gives me a reason to think that one is true. And this is a little slightly new idea, but I, I, it should be intuitive. I, I think once I talk about this, you'll find this intuitive. Um, there are two ways that you could give rational support or justification for a conclusion. One is by giving a positive reason to think it's true. Another way is to remove uh, liabilities, objections, problems with the acceptance of the conclusion. If I'm able to reply to an objection or show that an objection fails, I've done more to support my position. 
because the objection is trying to say my position's got these weaknesses and I'm saying like no I don't or it's not a big deal then that's a way that I'm defending my position that's a way I'm trying to justify drawing the conclusion is by dealing with the objections giving a rebuttal to them responding to them and all rebuttals and responses have in them the basic idea that the objection fails so if the objection fails, therefore the conclusion, that's more support for thinking the conclusion is true. So if it's true that the objection that we shouldn't buy the ring because it is expensive fails, then that gives more support for why we should think we should buy the ring. If it's just discounting, if it's like discounting without a response, just dismissing the objection, then you'd be done here. If the speaker is actually providing a response, if they're actually giving a reason that to respond to that objection, then that is going to fit in here as a sub-argument, as a supporting argument for why we should think that the objection fails. So put it here in standard form. In this, in claim spot four would be whatever claim justifies the, re or let's say whatever claim or claims are used to respond to the objection or to reply to the objection okay and then so you treat it as a placeholder for that and then don't just write this of course but fill in the actual content here in this passage the ring is expensive but beautiful they don't give us any reason for why we should think this objection fails so there wouldn't be this going on but let's say they did um, maybe they give the response like we got plenty of money and so that's we have plenty of money, therefore, the objection that we shouldn't buy the ring because it is expensive fails, maybe something like that. So that's how that would look. So that's how you can handle discounting. Discounting is pretty important, um, and it's good to catch because you can't take the claims that are involved with the discounting and just plop them, copy and paste them straightforwardly into your standard form. You're going to have to use this kind of way of massaging them or this model for how to capture those discounting moves in standard form and diagram. And I really recommend doing that. Uh, it's something to be tracking. Okay. Um, we are ready to talk about suppressed premises. So let's do that. Um, and I'm going to wipe our board here a little bit. All right, let's take a really simple argument as a toy case here. And actually, I'll, I'll use an argument I've given you before. This is a really good example. Remember this one? Hitting is wrong. Why? Because hitting causes pain. All right. So if I just said that, hitting is wrong because hitting causes pain, it's not very complicated to decide how to capture these claims. There's an explicit argument marker in what I just said that really makes it straightforward what's happening here. Um, and I know how to diagram it. So there we go. All the explicit things that have been offered in the passage. Here, I'll, I'll even, let's make this super explicit. So I say to you... Um, You shouldn't hit people, and then you ask why. I remember me talking with my toddler. Um, because hitting causes pain. So let's just say that's the utterance that we're analyzing here. That's all of the passage of argumentative bros that we're dealing with. Um, and this is pretty straightforward. We got the nice uh, reason marker here. You shouldn't hit people is the same as saying hitting is wrong. Um, the, the moral ambiguity, I'm an ethicist, so there's some moral ambiguity here theoretically, but whatever ambiguity is present here is captured here too. So there's, there's really no difference here between those uh, articulations. Um, so if we look at this argument, uh, we've done everything that we're supposed to be doing with the whole procedure here. We've captured everything that's been explicitly said. After you do that, you want to double check things. There's an extra step here for the whole capturing suppressed premises thing. 
And that's the step of taking a look at every arrow you've drawn in your standard form diagram thing and be like, is there something missing here? And the way you'll detect that something is missing is that there's an obvious gap in the support relation. In other words, that given two, that's not a good argument for thinking that one is true. There's like a big leap in logic that's happening here. Okay? Just because hitting causes pain, that doesn't mean hitting is wrong. That's a big leap in logic here. When I gave you this example before, I, you know, I said you could imagine my toddler says, I know. I, I, that's, I'm not compelled by your argument, daddy. Why? Because the whole point, I hit them because I was trying to cause them pain. Like, I already know that. I already know hitting causes pain. Why does that make it wrong? I don't get it. Right? There's a leap in logic here. The premise being true doesn't really, on its own, provide adequate support for thinking the conclusion is true. So when you're looking at the arguments that you're analyzing from others, and there seems to be like a huge leap in logic here that doesn't make any sense, or it makes the argument absurd, it's like absurdly bad as an argument, you want to think to yourself, is there some easy way to bridge this gap in the support relation that doesn't require me reading in or like putting words in their mouth that I don't think they really intend. Is there a way to recover this? And there is a way, and it's with suppressed premises. So when we're looking at this example here, we're like, okay, hitting is wrong because hitting causes pain. I want to capture the logic of what I think the speaker is going for here. And while they didn't say this directly, we can fill in the gap. Um, that there's another premise in here. I'm going to call it a helper premise. So it's going to look like this. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to use a little convention here of a parenthetical. Okay. So we got this. And the missing premise is that, as we talked about before, causing pain is wrong. There we go. And I'm not I'm not feeling like I'm throwing some words in their mouth or super controversial claims that maybe the speaker doesn't want to defend or something like that. I don't think I'm saddling them with argumentative baggage that they don't deserve. Um, that this seems to be the logic of what they have in mind. That if causing pain is wrong and hitting causes pain, now that does give me a good reason to think that hitting is wrong. Now that big leap in logic, it's been filled in. So... I call these helper premises because these suppressed premises as helper premises because what they're doing is helping the explicit premise count as a good reason for the conclusion. When the explicit premises offered are just like, yeah, that doesn't seem to count as a good reason to believe the conclusion, is there something easy that we could throw in there that that's all it takes in order to fill that gap and be like, oh, now I can see how two should count as a good reason for one. You may still disagree with the argument from there, but it's like, okay, I think that's what they're going for. I think that's the logic that they're offering here when they're making this incomplete argument. The, the fancy word for this is enthematic. Uh, so enthematic arguments have suppressed premises, and I'm calling them helper premises. Those are the ones I want you tracking. Uh, there's a whole exercise in the homework that's training you at looking for these things, so it's great practice. On the exam I said I'd have a section where I'm like, here's simple arguments, put them in standard form, and there are definitely suppressed premises, so be looking for them. And then on the last part of the exam, where you're doing the, the more complicated annotation standard form diagram with a larger argumentative passage, I'm not going to tell you whether there are suppressed premises or not, but it's an option. You want to have that tool in your toolkit, and maybe you can catch them if, if, if there are there. If they are there, you want to catch them. If there's not, if there's no need for it, then you don't have to worry about it. And and I and this isn't going to be a paranoid guessing game on your part because you always have a clear mandate for why you'd go looking for suppressed premises. If you get all the explicit premises down, and it just is an obviously and absurdly bad argument, then see if there's some easy way to help it out. Is there something I can throw in there? And it seems to enable the explicit premise to count for the conclusion. So you're not just pulling these things out of nowhere. You always have a mandate for your speculation about these hidden, unspoken assumptions, these helper premises. 
the helper premise is the thing that fills the gap that's present in the initial argument. Okay? And that's very, very important. Only worry about suppressed premises in this kind of scenario. There are other types of suppressed premises. It's true. Um, there are suppressed premises that work like this. They work as sub-arguments for claims that we make explicitly, like this. Okay? So when we're thinking about unspoken assumptions, some of our unspoken assumptions are a part of the logic of the explicit arguments we've offered, but some of them are background. And you're, you track this intuitively already when you're in conversations with people. When someone makes a claim, you're like, oh, why would they think that's true? Like when you're trying to have intellectual empathy, you're trying to like get inside their head, or using charity. You're like, why would they think that's true? Oh, maybe this is where they're coming from. They've got this background perspective or belief or something like that. Like when I say I'm having a casual conversation with someone and they express a political perspective or they adopt a political position, my mind is already starting to run about like, how does this person think about politics generally that it would be like why they think this is true, right? What's going on in the back of their minds? Where are they coming from? This kind of thing. And while they didn't say it, I might be able to speculate about it, and that's what's going on here. But there's a big danger about this that isn't present with the helper premise. With these kinds of unspoken claims, it's far more speculative. And I am sure that you have some experience with this already in your life, where people misunderstand where you're coming from based on the claims that you make. Like, uh, here's a really, really good example. Um, you know, I, I tell people, the be, uh, students in the beginning of class in the first week and like get to know you stuff, I'm like, well, I'm Christian, I'm Lutheran, and I'm Buddhist. And uh, I had a student a few quarters back that, um, yeah, let's, let, this is a little messy, but let's get into it. They, they, were, um, they were homosexual, and for me just saying that I was Christian, they kind of had this assumption going on that I'm, I think of homosexuality as unethical or immoral, and I don't. <laughs> but I can understand the stereotype, right? But it, it was sort of something, I mean, everything about my personality, it was an ethics class, I'm, I share my ethical perspectives here and there. I was, I was like, they could have pieced together what I thought about this based on everything else I believe. But it was still something that it took later on in the class for them to ask me about it and to hear me say explicitly what my position was on that. Um, but that can happen here. We're, we're like we're used to meeting people who hold certain beliefs, like claim to here, and and for certain reasons, and we might project that onto them. But it's super speculative and risky. And I, I think this isn't a bad thing to do in a conversation. But as long as you always double check with the person you're talking with, you you say something like, "So you made claim to." Um, I'm used to people thinking that claim true, uh, claim. Two is true because a claim four. Is that what's going on with you? So, you know, make the speculations, but check in with them about it. Don't just be like, I can psychoanalyze you and I don't have to talk to you about it, right? Hidden in a hidden sort of way. This is super dangerous um, because the risk of putting words in people's mouths that they don't really mean or don't believe is high in this case. And that's why I don't want you thinking about this at all for the homework problems, for the exam. This is where you get into paranoid territory really fast. So don't worry about this. The only kinds of suppressed premises I want you worried about are these kind, the helper premises. And the reason is that you've got a mandate. You've got the gap in the support relation is what informs you to, one, the need for a suppressed premise, and two, what sort of shape a suppressed premise is needed to fill in that gap. So um, that's, that's the really big thing here for suppressed premises. Um, that I'd want to emphasize. Only worry about these, don't worry about these for the homework or for the exam. Okay. One other detail, I mean that's basically it for suppressed premises. Um, the the devil's in the details here of course and the application step um, and so it's probably not until you get into that exercise from the homework where it's asking you to be tracking suppressed premises that you're really going to be able to tell how well you've understood this or how well you've mastered this technique. Um, but definitely be in touch with me about it. I really wish there was someone in the chat today that uh, we I could have like asked them, like, is this making sense if you want to ask any questions? No one was here today, though, so 
Um, if you do have questions, if that's not making sense to you, please let me know. Contact me, ask those questions, post them on the discussion boards, and, and we can talk about it some more. Um, but that's that's all the sort of theoretical, conceptual stuff about suppressed premises and what to be thinking about there. there except for one extra little detail. You might have noticed there's one remaining item from our annotations, and that's evaluative terms, evaluative, positive, and negative. And evaluative terms are really about making normative claims, if you remember from that lecture. So uh, here we go. In this example, this is a perfect example. The conclusion is normative, right? It's about what's right and wrong or good and bad. Hitting is wrong, that's a normative claim. Hitting causes pain. That's not normative. That's just descriptive. That's just saying how the world is, not how it ought to be. Uh, and causing pain is wrong here. This is a normative claim. Okay? The reason, part of the reason, for why we want to track these normative versus descriptive claims, why we want to catch evaluative terms when they're happening, is because in any argument that has a normative conclusion and it only has descriptive premises, let's put this up here for a second, it only has descriptive premises, you know there's going to be a suppressed premise. Because descriptive claims on their own cannot logically prove normative claims. Just because the world is a certain way doesn't mean it ought to be that way. Okay? Um, so, every, every argument like this, normative conclusion, only descriptive premises are being explicitly offered, that should set the alarm bells off in your head that there's going to be a suppressed premise in here, and it's got to be a normative suppressed premise. Okay? Um, so this, this example we are using is a, a perfect example of why tracking normative claims and principles is important for catching suppressed premises. The book talks about three types of suppressed premises, and I have a little commentary on this for you. Um, whoa, what just happened? Whoa, my video bugged out for a second here. Weird. Okay, so we're back there. Let's bring this up. All right. So um, the book talks about here. So validity is important here because without validity, we won't be able to tell where there are gaps in the support relation. Again, like I said in the last video, when the book is talking about validity in this chapter, it really just means a good support relation. So that could be strength. So watch out for that. Um, so uh, yeah, that's this note right here, this crucial note. Um, but then when we're, we're using suppressed premises to fix that as, in a way that is charitable, right? Um, and they are the common types of suppressed premises the book talks about. Contingent facts, linguistic principles, and evaluative premises. The evaluative premises, that's number one on your radar. That's the top priority for what you want to be tracking and catching. Um, that's really, really important. Um, contingent facts are second. Um, sometimes the contingent facts are important. A lot of times we'll leave them out when they're so obvious that they don't need to be said, like things that everyone knows or common sense or something like that. But contingent facts, that could get in there. Um, but it's not maybe as high of a priority here as evaluative premises. Linguistic principles, though, please don't worry about these at all. Um, I don't. I, I, I won't fault you uh, for ignoring them entirely on the exam, at the very least. This is where I've seen students really go off the rails with paranoia, um, where we have to throw in all these suppressed premises to define every single word that's being used in an argument. No, nah, you don't have to do that. That's not required. Um, why would we include linguistic principles? This is really something philosophers are generally concerned about. It's not just for philosophers, but because philosophers are oftentimes talking about ideas that are uncommon or that are counterintuitive and we don't have ready-made language for these complex or abstract ideas, um, we have to use the language we've got to work with and we invent new uses of language or technical terminology all the time. And sometimes it's easy to misinterpret what someone is saying in philosophy. So there, it might be really important to clarify what we mean with certain words and phrases. Um, so that there, there are certain assumptions here about what this word means. A lot of philosophical terms use words that we use in non-philosophical ways or in non-technical ways. So 
sense. You might, and you might not always pick up on that if you're looking at a passage of philosophy, uh, philosophical argumentation. Um, you might need to be like, oh, there's something goofy going on here. Yeah, I think the speaker, the person who's writing, is using this word in a really technical way that's different from what we might otherwise think. And so I might, if I'm reconstructing their argument in standard form, I might throw in a suppressed premise here. And by the way, when this word means this kind of thing. But in general, don't worry about this. Really, don't don't be looking to track that. Um, so that's my advice on that. Um, okay, I think that, uh, oh, right, uh, I'll say a little something about this. I'm not going to lecture on this, but I've got this step eight, or the book talks about assessing the truth of the premises. This is real, and I break it down into a more step-by-step -step procedure here. This is really getting into evaluating arguments and, and talking about this idea of fundamental principles. Um, this is not part of the curriculum for the exam. This is sort of the transition from evaluating, or uh, I'm sorry, this is a transition from um, articulating what's going on with the argument, like the listening step of just what is the person saying, transitioning into the evaluation. And uh, we're not we're not doing the evaluation yet. That's going to start with the chapter six material and, and Thursday's lecture. So we don't want to get ahead of ourselves here. But it's a nice transition. Maybe after you're you're getting into chapter six stuff, read this last bit of my lecture notes. Um, I, I have a little bit of an axe to grind here about the book's treatment of fundamental principles. Um, the bottom line of it is that personally, philosophically, I don't believe in fundamental principles. Um, anything that appears to be fundamental, like where the buck stops, we can criticize. We can explore. We'd be like, why would we think that? The rabbit hole of the why, 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 why thing goes on forever. And it might just be, it, it could be fair to say that uh, right now, you and I are having a disagreement and it comes down to fundamental principles that we just don't see eye to eye about. But I don't think that should be used to say, therefore, the conversation is over and there's nothing more for us to do. Right now, we might not know where the conversation should go next. What would be the underlying whys that go from there, but I don't think that means that they're not there. There's lots of times in which either individually in your own life or we're looking at the stretch of human civilization, the whole history of us, um, that something we thought was fundamental and then we're like, no, we can give an argument for that. Uh, just as an illustration of this, um, I've had some conversations with people, maybe I've even brought this up before, uh, where they think of, oh, tolerance, the moral value of tolerance. That's just a fundamental moral truth. And if someone disagrees with me about it, they're just wrong. I don't know what else to say. We're just coming at life from two completely different frames of reference. Someone who's like dogmatic and intolerant versus someone who's open-minded and tolerant. Um, but as you actually ask the questions about that, uh, why is tolerance a moral value? There actually are answers to give. It doesn't have to just be something you just like stick in the mud about. There's, this is the bedrock. Um, same thing happens in the context of conversations around faith in, in religious contexts. If you want to talk to me about that, I'm not going to do that here, but if you want to talk outside of class, be happy to explore that with you. Uh, sort of rational defense of faith kind of things. Um, maybe I've also mentioned uh, when I teach business ethics, we get into social justice a lot. It's very relevant for that class, that subject matter. And there are these like different fundamental views about what uh, social justice looks like, whether liberty and freedom is the most important principle of social justice or whether people's well-being, quality of life, their happiness is fundamental. This is like the difference between uh, libertarians and social liberals. And a lot of my students are like, anyone who's coming from the other side, I just don't understand them and we can't talk. We're just going to talk past each other. This isn't going to be a productive debate. We just have fundamental differences, fundamental principles that are not the same, that are not compatible. But after they take the class and you get into some of the moral theory behind these things, you start to see, oh, yeah, there is a way in which these two perspectives can have a conversation and even a debate with each other. And maybe even we can actually resolve that disagreement. There's something to be said for these things. So that's just a little two cents there at the end. Um, okay, I'm going to wrap up this lecture now. Uh, code, uh, let's do, um, 
Well, I was just talking about this with a, a colleague here over the break I took. Uh, urban farm. That's our code phrase for, for this lecture. So that'll be it. Again, this is now it for everything preparing up for the exam. There's a study guide on Canvas that will show you um, a kind of a list of all the main concepts from the curriculum that the exam covers. And it also includes a description of every type of uh, problem that will be on the exam, the sort of instructions for it, how many points they're worth, and how many of them there will be on the exam. So I, I try to give you, um, I, I want my exams to be no surprises. I want you to know exactly what to expect and what's going to happen. And as you're preparing to take the exam online, it's going to be opened up soon here this week, um, as you're getting prepared to take it, if you don't know what to expect, let's talk. If those resources I'm providing still leave things ambiguous to you, um, let's talk about it. If you're not sure what are adequate answers to certain types of problems, um, if you have questions about the homework exercises and the answers that I've given out, talk to me. Um, anything about my lectures that's confusing, anything at all, I'm here. I, I've, I want to be here for you. I'm in your corner. Um, I'm a resource. Use me, please. Um, I, I don't want there to be anything goofy, no surprises. I, I want it to be very clear in your mind what you need to do and what I'm asking for. Um, taking exams where the expectations are unclear is the worst, and I, I want to do everything in my power um, to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and of course, you have to use the resources I provide, uh, and they're there for you, and you, so start there. But I'm also one of those resources, and you can talk to me. And, and ask me questions. So call me up, get a hold of me somehow, and let's make that happen so that you can go into the exam um, with some more confidence. Um, it, you can expect that it's going to be tough. And even if you've got the material down, it'll still be a struggle. So if you're struggling with homework problems, um, that doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. Like informal logic is just tough. Like, like I said, we're going to take something confusing and fuzzy and make it slightly less confusing and fuzzy. But it still might be confusing and fuzzy. Like, you're always going to have to make judgment calls. Hopefully, if you've mastered the material, you know how to make those judgment calls as informed judgment calls. You know how to deal with fuzziness. You know how to attack ambiguity and confusion and can sort it out. Um, but uh, my, my guess is that you will take the exam and you'll be like, Gave it my it, best case scenario. I give it my best shot, and um, I feel good about my answers. They make sense to me. I think I kn I knew going into this what I needed to do to give an acceptable answer of this type. But you might still be like, maybe I missed something. You know, it's possible. I, I I took my best crack at it. And well, like I said, with the makeup exam at the beginning of this whole lecture, um, there's going to be a, a chance to see how it goes, uh, to diagnose it, to debrief it, and uh, and then recalibrate and and take another shot with the makeup exam. And I want to be a part of that process with you, so let me know. Okay, good luck with this. I will see you Thursday uh, for the Chapter 6 material. And I think Wednesday I might be trying to... Man, Wednesday might be tough. I might not be able to get to that uh, homework 3 explanation video then, but I'll give it a shot. I'll be trying to fit that in. My Wednesday's pretty packed. But I'll be seeing you soon, one way or the other. And hopefully I'll talk to you soon, too. All right, good luck.